Logan, and forgive me. It's July. <laughs> the, the July um, 6th, Metro Water Services Stormwater Management Commission welcome applicants, uh, audience, and distinguished guests. I see we have a few today, and, um, and staff and members of the committee. Um, I would like to call this meeting to order, and first item of business is for, uh, really for me and the committee to welcome our newest committee members, soon to be commissioner, as uh, hopefully things prevail in our uh, Metro Council meeting tonight, Ms. Brittany Simpson. And if I, if I would, may, if I may, I'd like for you to give us a couple words of who you are. Yes, uh, my name is Brittany Simpson. I have lived in Nashville since 2005. I was not the Bar Association to join this committee. Um, I currently am employed at Silicon Ranch Corporation, where I'm the Engineering Procurement and Construction Legal Counsel. Outstanding. We're thrilled to have you. Thank you. Um, all right. Well, our second order of business, as customary, is to for our, our committee members to review, approve, and or edit our June 1st meeting minutes and decision letters. I will let our members take a moment to review those at this time. We usually give a couple minutes here to scan through those, those, those letters as uh, council has requested we do that publicly and deliberate pu publicly for any issues or edits to those minutes or decision letters. And also, as customary, I'd like to receive a motion that combines uh, the ruling of the minutes and the decision letters in one motion. And good morning. In order to use your microphones, you will have to activate them and then speak, and then you will always have to turn them off. I don't think they got what you were saying. Thank you. And the, the May minutes, there was a revision as well. I think we had it previously amended it, but that's in the only tablet as well. If you want to look at the main minutes, make sure it looks good okay. for the, the statement. That was in reference to um, uh, mitigation on metro properties. Yes. Okay. Basically, the same statement you sent me. Yeah, it's just, you know, like whenever when, when we were at a restaurant, everybody's looking at the menu, the waiter never really knows when you're ready, kind of. So be glad to entertain a motion at any time. So moved. All right. We have a motion. Any second? Second. Okay. Any, we have a motion and properly seconded. Any discussion? Great. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Oh, we have... Yep, and then any abstaining? I'll abstain. Yes, Brittany. Abstain. And Jay, yes, wonderful. All right, motion carries. Okay, um, so the next uh, order of business is our first case. I'd like to ask our applicant to come up. The first case is the 2023 quadruple one 7433 Sawyer Brown Road. I'd like to ask that applicant to come up. I think you folks have been here before, so you know most of the, the drill. It's, we, I think we know each other almost on a first name basis now, so good to see you <laughs> here once again. Uh, I will go over the procedure such that our new applicant can uh, uh, have a guide for how this goes down. Uh, we will essentially allow the applicant's uh, MC to introduce the team that will be presenting and provide a 10-minute pr uh, presentation period for which the, the applicant has the floor. After that, well, before that, excuse me, uh, Mr. Bowman will read the applicant their Miranda rights. Uh, the applicant will proceed with their 10-minute presentation, and then uh, we will open up the floor for public comment, um, and we will close 
public comment, and then the committee will, will deliberate. Okay? So if I may uh, turn it over to Logan to read the applicant's Miranda rights. <laughs> Opening statements of the applicant. If you are not satisfied with a decision made by the Stormwater Management Committee, you may appeal the decision by filing for a writ of certiorari with the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court. Your appeal must be filed within 60 days of the date of the committee's decision. You are advised to seek the independent advice of legal counsel to ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been satisfied. Case number one on the agenda, 2023-00001-7433 Sawyer Brown Road at 7433 Sawyer Brown Road, APN 114-000-24400, Inspectors Kimberly Hayes, Council District 22, Gloria Hauser. Applicants request disturbance of the Zone 2 floodway buffer to build a driveway, continuous mowing and maintenance of portions of the stream buffer. Appellant is Big V Rentals, LLC, represented by Marlon Bonilla, Architepo Studios. Comments, Stormwater staff. Previous comment, applicant is proposing a driveway related to construction of a garage. Applicant is also requesting to mow, maintain portions of the Zone 1 buffer and floodway. Updated comment. Applicant is proposing a driveway related to construction of a garage. Applicant is also requesting to mow and maintain portions of the Zone 1 buffer and floodway. Staff request a portion of the buffer is not mowed or maintained. July meeting updated comment. Applicant is proposing a driveway related to construction of a garage. Applicant has revised their mitigation plan to expand their buffer coverage area. Staff recommends that a no mow slash maintain area, the width of the floodway plus an additional width, beyond the floodway be preserved as determined by the Stormwater Management Committee. Codes, no comment provided. Planning had no comment provided. Greenways, no comment provided. Okay, thank you, Logan. At this time, I'd like to allow the applicant to make their presentation. Good morning uh, to all the members of the committee. My name is Marlon Bonilla, and I'm here to represent Archetypo Studio. Uh, and I got with me Mr. Rocky LeBlanc. He is representing as in tech engineering. Can we do our exposition right now? Yes. Okay. Yes, please. Right. I think we're pulling it up um, on the screen here. Thank you. So, um, well, our intention is to get the approval from this committee to build a new driveway on a portion of the zone buffer two to provide access to a building outside the that will be built outside the floodplain. This parcel has an existing driveway that runs across the property and that it's been there since 2007. Um, well, we've been here before <laughs> and uh, we've tried to follow all the recommendations from the member of the committee. However, some of these recommendations weren't functional to the client's purposes and um, uh, at the time when applying it to a project. Um, so per our last meeting, the two comments that, uh, that we had from some of the members of the, of the board was number one, to build a retaining wall and have a driveway to get across the buffer and enter the doors to the side of the building. And uh, we sent a model to Mr. Logan. Uh, we sent an email where we tried to do that in a model. And um, this was back in June the 5th. It was just showing a sketch and also including a, a 3D model based on this recommendation, however, the option was making it very difficult uh, to drive and park the owner's RV, which is like the primary idea of the whole garage, is for her to have the RV inside. It would make it really difficult and almost force her to just back it up because the road that she's using uh, to drive it is not Sawyer Brown. It's the other road, which I think it's, I think it's Charlotte Pike. Old Charlotte, Old Charlotte Pike. Pike. Yes, so that's the way she comes, and, and to drive it back, it would be, it would be really, really difficult for, for them. And the second um, recommendation that we have was to install pervious pavers with an 18-inch uh, subgrade in lieu of concrete, which was our original proposal. <clears throat> and I'm sorry. And uh, after having a discussion with our structural and civil engineer, he uh, considered that uh, because of the RV's gross weight, um, he thinks that probably those previous pavers may not be the, the best, the ideal option, uh, especially because we have a little bit of slope. And uh, so he was considering that um, 
using it, it could probably produce damage to the driveway in the, in the time. And so um, our new proposal, um, although it shows the building in the same original position we have, and as well as the, the driveway location, the difference in what we're proposing right now is, um, well, number one, the amount of disturbance, if you guys can see it, it's uh, we reduce the driveway to almost a 50% to what we had originally. And um, we reduce it from 29, um, 2,900 square feet to only 1,540. And um, we have also proposed this driveway to be impervious concrete. Uh, the, our structural, sorry, our structural engineer is uh, considering to use either a six inch or eight inch thick driveway. Um, and uh, let me see. And our client acknowledges that she's going to have to use um, one of the companies to uh, build the driveway that uh, I believe the city has. Um, and also, she agrees to commit to give the driveway the proper maintenance required, whatever it is. Um, also, uh, our client has canceled the mowing and maintenance request in Zone 1. As you guys can see that in uh, our sheet C1.3. And uh, finally, our mitigation plan um, shows the original area that we had for mitigation. So right now, based on the reduction that we have from the disturbance area, right now we could say our mitigation is around a 219% based on, on that size. So, um, so that would conclude our uh, presentation and we hopefully fulfill um, the committee's requirements. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. This time I'd like to open up the public uh, session for any comments. Do we have any here that are in support or in opposition in the audience? Okay, seeing none. Um, Logan, do we have any letters or as Chair Dodd would say uh, airmail or blimps. We did not have anything on this case. Okay, great. All right, at that time, at this time, I'd like to close the public session and open it up for our committee to review and comment. And I, I will say that this is the uh, second time the applicant. No, excuse me, yeah, this will be the third time that the applicant has been before us. They have exhibited uh, 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 great, uh, they've received our feedback well in incorporating our comments, and I think this last uh, addition incorporates those, but I think we probably have a few more things to discuss here amongst the group. I'll make a point of clarification on Mr. Bonilla's uh, statement. His reference to previous concrete, we require a certified installer. So that's what he was saying. We, a Tennessee concrete certified installer to install that if that product's used. And were there any comments from staff as the applicant has been working through this that we should need to consider specifically? I think our concern was if they mow the whole, how they're going to mow the whole zone one buffer exactly? Like some of the zone one buffer comes on the other side of the driveway. Yeah, we we, we thought that um, what should be done is potentially set the no mow area as the floodway plus a certain number of feet because the zone one buffer does cross the driveway in areas and would be impractical to leave part of it unmowed going across the driveway. So, so, so maybe some distance from the floodway just to make it conti contiguous mm -hmm. along that area. Okay, great, thank you. Okay. Is, is pervious concrete or is it permitted? Now, I know it's highly discouraged. Yeah, I'd say it's maybe highly discouraged, but. And then have y'all talked to anybody about the feasibility of installation of it? Because it's, you've got it at a, looks like a 16 to 18% slope or so. I don't 
understand. I'm sorry, could you please repeat the question? It, it's, can that product be installed at the slope that's shown on the plan? Maybe I'll confirm that. Or do you know it, the, the driveway leading up into that garage is, you got five feet of grade going that you're, away, you're over about 30 feet. So that's just a, that's very steep. You talking about the, the, the slope of the driveway? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think the first, the first grade's like seven and a half feet, and then it's like five feet after that, and then most of them are five to seven feet apart. So we were trying to figure out, you know, once we get onto the level pad, you know, that the bus is gonna be able to clear, and uh, we figured out that it, it will. So, I think what um, Jay's asking is, have you talked to the concrete installers to make sure that that's actually doable, that steep of a slope, right? Um, well, we spoke to our uh, civil and, and structural engineer. Um, he agrees that it might be the problem is that we don't have the list of the companies that do it and that are certified. Um, I believe that's something that we would get if we get approved. So um, it's it's like we, we don't have all the information right, right now. Yes, yes, ma'am. So I think the, the piece to tag to that is it's, it's going to be a pervious pavement and it may be uh, pervious pavers or grass pave even as a solution for the, the pervious product that's within the, the buffer. I think it would be a amenable solution to what's explicitly called out if it's not able to be installed due to means and methods. Will the applicant be okay with an alternate pervious pavement product? If it's something that, I mean, I guess the first option would be the pervious concrete. If it's not something feasible, then of course they will agree to use whatever a pervious product it's going to be required. That's okay. Yes. Can you speak to how you're going to keep the property owner from mowing? Um, what signage and what are you going to do to ensure that that is? You know, the no mow zone is protected. I have uh, knowledge that um, um, Mr. Logan has already had communication with the owner regarding the signs, and I think they also have, uh, I think it was preliminary plans of where the signs were going to be located and um, the type of sign. I, it's not something that I would, I mean, it's out of my scope, but I understand it's the owner it's all, um, already had communication with Mr. Logan about it. And I, I wanted to get some clarification on the mowing and maintenance request. So you said it was waived, but is there any portion on the other side of the driveway that is in zone one that will be mowed? And maybe I misunderstood the previous statement. Uh, no, ma'am. Um, if you can see... Uh, Sheet C1.3, it shows a hatched area. That is the only area we're proposing to maintain and, and mow, which is uh, zone two. So zone one is everything. Everything is clear. It, it's not going to be mowed, maintained. Okay. Thank you. And can you clarify the amount of reduction of pavement in the zone two buffer that you've done from the first submission uh, three sessions ago to today? Yes, sir. The original was 2,900 um, square feet. I believe there was a typo in our plans, and it wasn't updated in this sheet. Um, but now it is uh, 1,540 square feet. That's what we're doing right now. Tell me what the first one was again. I'm sorry. Uh, 2,900 square foot. Okay, so you've you've decreased it about 1,400 square feet. Like 14. Yes, yes, sir. Like a 48, 49 percent. I think Mr. Fulmer had some concerns last time of the drainage swale or the plantings that were adjacent to the drainage swale uh, in the first meeting. That I'm trying to find the landscape plan here to see the mitigation and how we've addressed that. I think you've, that's L, L1.
Does that satisfy your uh, comment? You know, they, they still have a pipe discharging straight into a flower bed. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's likely problematic. Um, it'd probably be better to split that out. That way it doesn't blow out the mulch or yeah. you know, co cover the pipe. And But that's more of a detailed design mm -hmm. comment. That, that's right. You know, we're more focused on the on letting the driveway be in the zone one. Well, I think all of the existing or the majority of the existing driveway is in the zone one. The addition is primarily zone two. Just for clarification, is that correct? And can you, one more time for the committee, uh, elaborate on your uh, alternate plan that you had developed and showed as a, a paper attachment that I don't believe was in our packet? Sure. I'll, I'll, let, I'll pass it. Sure. Let's just start here, and then we'll uh, pass it around if we have any comments. I'll just make a point of clarification, too, on this site. Uh, the original discussion about mowing and maintenance started with a different person, the contractor that's doing the renovations for the existing house. So the buffer was originally applied because of that. So we're, we're also going to be holding those finals until all these conditions are met, if they're going to put up buffer signs. But the, the garage itself will require a building permit at some point. connection of the property from the plans to Charlotte Pike, is there? The survey doesn't show it. Okay. There's a yeah, dirt the driveway aerial. on an aerial. Let's talk about the mitigation that's proposed and with respect to the disturbance and if we feel that that is adequate. Let's just let's take a methodological meth, uh, um, methodological <laughs> approach here. Sorry, I'm minorly jet lagged. <laughs> so, um, maybe I'm always this way. Who knows? You guys can be tell me that. Um, let's let's go step by step here. So let's talk about the mitigation. Do we have any comments? on what's been proposed. We've got um, a, an area of disturbance that, please remind me of that value again so I don't misquote it. Um, now it's, uh, right now it's uh, 1,540 square foot. Yes, sir. And the, the area of mit mitigation currently is? 3,375 square foot. And that is all represented here in this sheet L 1.1 directly across from the doors of the garage. That's 3,000 square feet? Yes, yes, sir. That's what we have on the latest um, 
uh, mitigation plan? I, I think that I would be accepting of it if, yeah, I'm on. Um, if, if there's a lot of area in zone one that's further to the, I guess it's to the north, point and left, and so where they're adding the mitigation, there's an existing tree line and just a little bit of grass right next to the driveway. There's a, on an aerial, there's a big dirt spot down that's in the floodway, but there's some zone one areas that look like kind of barren grass, and maybe those will be better served if we can, you know, do, do double the square footage mitigation, move those plantings over there, it alleviates the, the point discharge of that pipe, mm -hmm. run it through it all, and would probably serve the stream a lot better. Um, just because there's not as much of a tree line over there. Agreed. So essentially um, extending the mitigation, which is on the east side of the driveway, uh, further south to bridge the gap between the existing pavement and the tree line. I, I would just pick it up and move it. Just pick it up and move it. Like towards Charlotte. Mm-hmm. And, and also, you know, make an effort to um, to do a compensation at a at a ratio high enough to mitigate the encroachment in the zone two, but it would also put it in the zone one buffer, which would be more beneficial for those native grasses and, and plantings. Yeah. Is that something that y'all can be amenable to? Um, uh, how much more mitigation would you propose to? increase so if you've got a you know if you're putting driveway in 1500 square feet of zone two if you can do a, a two to one ratio in zone one two. and just a perimeter of a planting bed and that would be subject to review by staff to verify that it sure yes sir rebecca can you pull up the aerial for everyone. Okay, so just to be clear, that mitigation is currently proposed would be um, re relocated and, and spread along the east side of the driveway. Uh, this can't be said towards Old Charlotte Pike. North. Is that the narrower stretch that's between the driveway and the tree line? Current mitigation, I think you said, and for, for, for it to be a two to one, I think you, your area of disturbance was around 1,500 square feet, and your mitigation currently is at 3,000? That's right. Okay. Yeah, but somehow on the plans, that L1, the area of the plantings does not look like it would be double. That was what I was asking no. for. That would be subject to review by staff to confirm yeah. Yeah. that the square footages are met. Yeah. Just visually, it doesn't look great. Agreed. <laughs> so. Okay. Do you have something? All right. Sounds like we have a, a motion in in the in the works here through this discussion. I'll entertain one. Uh, make a motion to approve with the condition that the mitigation uh, is shifted to be in the zone one buffer and at a two to one ratio of the pervious pavement being installed in the zone two buffer. Right, we have a motion that has been properly seconded. Do we want to put something in about condition? Yeah, if the pavement 
the pervious pavement isn't feasible? It, it should be pervious in nature without the requirement of it being concrete for, for the uh, driveway portion. Yeah, okay. It's in the zone two. And then the buffer signs, do you want them on where they're proposed and at the edge of the zone one buffer or just on the north side of, or the east side of the driveway? Because they've got that small portion of the zone one that comes onto the west side of the driveway. Uh, on the east side of the driveway. Okay, we've had a motion, we've had it properly seconded, we've had some discussion, any additional discussion? <laughs> um, do we need to read, Miss? Sure, let's go ahead and incorporate that into the motion. I, I make a motion to vacate previous motion <laughs> <laughs> and replace. Uh, we'll replace with, um, you can just withdraw it if your second agrees. Yeah, well, <laughs> so I'll make a motion to uh, relocate the mitigation at a two to one ratio into the zone one buffer to the north subject to staff's approval uh, to allow the uh, buffer signage to be on the east side of the driveway and for the driveway in the zone two buffer to be of a pervious uh, material. Great. We have a motion, we have a second? I'll second. We have a motion that's been properly seconded. Any further discussion? Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none. Any abst abstained? None. Great. Motion carries. Thank you. Okay. Third time's a charm. All right. Next case, if the applicant could please come to the... The desk is uh, case number 2023-004-135 Kingston Street. I believe we know each other on a first name basis by now as well. This is your third time. Great. Well, hopefully your luck is uh, carried from the previous <laughs> applicants, but we shall see. So I think you guys are familiar with the procedure here. So I will let uh, Logan read you the Miranda rights and we will get your presentation started thereafter. Opening statement to the applicant, if you are not satisfied with the decision made by the Stormwater Management Committee, you may appeal the decision by filing for a writ of certiori with the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court. Your appeal must be filed within 60 days of the date of the committee's decision. You are advised to seek the independent advice of legal counsel to ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been satisfied. Case number two on the agenda, case 2023-00004-135 Kingston Street at 135 Kingston Street. APN is 071-130-11500. Inspector is Kimberly Hayes, Council District 5, Sean Parker. Applicants request disturbance of the Zone 1 and Zone 2 floodway buffer, continuous mowing and maintenance of portions of the floodway buffer, modified buffer signage is necessary. Appellant is Raymond and Mary Euford, represented by Michael Garrigan, Dell and Associates. Comments, stormwater staff, Staff requests that if the plan is approved, the landscape plan is revised so that no one tree species constitutes more than 20% of the total. If approved, staff recommends a variance condition be included that a long-term maintenance plan agreement be recorded with a register of deeds for any off-site and or on-site development via the MWS permitting process. Codes, no comment provided. Planning, no comment provided. Greenways, the applicant agreed at the May 4th, 2023 Stormwater Management Committee meeting to work with the Greenways and Open Space Division staff to dedicate a conservation greenway e easement over the floodway of Pages Branch plus 25 feet on both sides of the floodway on this parcel. The easement should be delineated and labeled on the site plan and should only include the property the applicant owns. The easement must be dedicated and memorialized in a Metro Parks Conservation Greenway Easement Agreement with two exhibits a legal description and a boundary survey of the easement, which must be recorded with the Davidson County Register of Deeds Office prior to any use and occupancy or the issuance of a use and occupancy letter resulting from the construction of a dwelling on the subject property. 
The applicant should coordinate with the Metro Parks Greenway staff regarding Park Board and Metro Council approval processes for the easement. Wonderful. Okay. At this time, I, I will let the applicant uh, start their 10 minute presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Michael Garrigan. I'm with Dell and Associates, 516 Heather Place. Um, just briefly to start, um, we have uh, continued working with Greenways and, and come to an agreement. The heavy gray, gray color you see on that plan is the conservation easement. Um, so to, to go back 60-ish days or so, um, you know, this site was originally a duplex, a large duplex, existed in the zone one buffer. Uh, caught fire, was condemned by Metro, and subsequently demolished everything but the foundation. Um, so currently there is a 1,500 square foot foundation sitting in the zone one buffer. And as part of um, this request that would be removed and heavily landscaped part of the mitigation plan for this piece of property. Um, and in its place, not in the zone one buffer, but 500 square feet, 548 square feet, about a third of, of the impervious that's in the zone one today is being requested in the zone two. Um, so two months ago, we were asked to defer and come back with a stream determination and a heavier uh, mitigation plan. Uh, we came back with the stream determination. It uh, had a secondary indicator score of 15, which is typically a wet weather conveyance. However, the uh, environmentalists, due to it being mapped by FEMA, named, and, and you know, um, sometimes when it quacks like a duck, you know, uh, so it was determined to be a stream, even though it didn't have physical characteristics. Um, in addition, the um, beefed up landscape plan was provided. Uh, there were a lot of discussions um, last time about the adjacent parcels. Um, those are uh, moving forward. The, the one next door has been submitted to the Board of Zoning Appeals for the variance that we were granted for the setback, the street setback encroachment, um, so that it can be constructed as a duplex with no stream buffer encroachments. And they won't come before you guys, essentially. Um, to me, you know, we, we also discussed hardship the last couple of times that uh, if you scroll down the street, that makes this lot unique to all the others that have this buffer. It's the only one that cannot be built on without a zone two encroachment. Um, the other item requested was um, additional mitigation. Um, we are taking the foundation out of the zone one and landscaping it. Uh, it was requested that we attempt to mitigate our impact on the zone two. Um, we've done so by providing a site uh, that my client, Alex Crawl, to my right, owns uh, off of Elizabeth? Elizabeth Road in Wardell. Um, it's approximately 100 feet wide. It has a zone two buffer that is bare. Um, pictures have been provided along with the survey and a landscape plan showing that 100 feet being heavily landscaped in place for about the 50 foot. So it's about a two to one that, that our proposed home would sit on. Um, it may be hard to see from this view, but that back property line, there's a, a essentially a fence there and it's, you know, it wiggles in, wiggles out, but it's plus or minus the zone one. Um, and, and if you had the pic, if you could pull up the pictures, you would see that it's just managed lawn at this time. Um, so that would be landscape provided with um, stream buffer signage and put in a conservation easement. Um, so, you know, in closing, I think we have shown that we do have an extreme hardship. There's a small triangle, maybe 20 square feet of the property that's not encumbered by a buffer. Uh, there was, um, I guess you wouldn't call it a natural disaster, but there was a fire that um, removed the um, structure or caused the removal of the existing structure on this property. And yes, insurance did pay the owners of that property for that structure. They, however, they did not, they did not recoup any um, funds for what the land is worth, um, you know, what sat underneath the house. I think that was something that there was some discussion on in the prior meetings. 
Um, we've gone to the Board of Zoning Appeals, obtained two variances for a side yard setback and a street setback to the smallest number that building code will allow um, without four-hour block firewalls and no windows. <laughs> So, I mean, we, we've really gone to extremes um, to make this a usable property and build a, a, a smaller home in today's standards um, that, that we hope can pr present itself as an affordable type structure for workforce housing. Um, I will let Alex add anything that he sure. desires. Yeah, Alex Craw, uh, 610 Basswood Avenue. I'm with C&H Properties. Uh, we're under contract to purchase this lot from the owners that suffered the fire. I think Michael did a terrific job summarizing our first two meetings. Um, I just wanted to also add that uh, 135 Kingston Street, this lot is at the end, end of the block face, and it's, it's the last parcel and obviously the one most affected by the floodway. Uh, with about 97% of buffers covering the entire lot. Um, I do have firsthand knowledge that, like you mentioned, one attached HPR, three lots over at 125 Kingston Street has already pulled permits for for an attached, uh, attached townhome project. We've also recently gone under contract to purchase the lot two doors down at 127 Kingston Street. And as Michael mentioned, that will not require um, a stormwater variance in order to build. Um, it has a wide enough area to just require a, a setback, a BZA setback variance that has already been approved for this lot. Um, and we do have knowledge that there's a single family home planned next door at 131 Kingston Street that's already been surveyed. They have not submitted their building permits yet, but based on the preliminary survey, I don't believe they will need a stormwater variance to build either. Um, so I just wanted to point that information to, to further the hardship for, for our lot, and I appreciate everyone's time and consideration. Okay, great. Is that the conclusion of the presentation? Yes, sir. Great. Okay. At this time, I'd like to open up the public uh, opportunity for comment. Is there anybody here in support or in opposition? Okay, seeing none. Logan, did we receive any letters? No, nothing on this case. Okay, great. All right, I'll close the public session and the applicant's presentation um, and open it up to the committee. I think just in, in recap, this is the third uh, visit in front of the committee. They've come back every time with a response to what we've requested, and I'll maybe give a few of those pieces. Uh, one was at the first uh, presentation, they did not have uh, BZA approval on the setbacks. I think they've received that, and you have record of that as a confirmation. Yes, that's correct. Okay, uh, so that's that's been recorded. The second piece is uh, to provide us a stream determination, and that is of a f score of a 15. Did the state concur with it being a wet weather conveyance? Do we have comments from them? I'm not certain that it was submitted to the state as it, once it's considered a stream, it's just. It was not. Okay, okay, all right. Um, the other piece that we had requested is any ex exploration and there being a public benefit to this variance for the home to be constructed within the zone two buffer. And I see Ms. Gr Ms. Harrison here of Greenway, so it seems like uh, there's been some collaboration there, which is has been shown in the in the conservation easement that's that's clouded on the plans you've submitted. So we are pleased to see the public benefit from this piece. Um, and then uh, I think we had asked the applicant to stay out of the zone one buffer completely, and I think they've demonstrated that. Um, were there any other requests that we had as a committee for the applicant that needed to be followed up on? I believe there was the offsite mitigation, which they discussed today with the, the separate parcel. Yes. Thank you. You you are a, a good student and reviewer of the tapes. <laughs> I appreciate the 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 piece there. So yes, the offsite mitigation. Okay. All right. It's about six um, pieces that we had requested them to go back to do. And is there any further discussion on what's been presented to us today? I just want to know, was staff satisfied with, you know, the plantings and signage plans and those things? 
I think to us in looking over the plan, the main thing was on the offsite mitigation that it be a condition that a long-term maintenance plan be associated with it because it's not going to be going through the permitting process per se. So that would put that on that deed uh, as a requirement that has been imposed on the parcel. A conservation easement would work for that as well. Are you intending to construct a house at the Elizabeth Road uh, parcel? Yes. Okay. It's actually two different adjacent parcels, and we do plan on constructing homes on both. So you'll have a long-term maintenance plan associated with that anyway? We will. Through the infill process? And, and there was, just, just to speak to that, there was a little bit of, of back and forth now that we do have the conservation easement. We certainly don't want to plant trees that they'll just have to tear down. So that may be something that we, um, depending on what they're planning, obviously. Uh, and there was also a small discussion currently on the site plan. There are two uh, stormwater uh, practices, a rain garden and a French drain, which aren't necessary by the previous numbers. We're actually net negative. We just kind of wanted to go above and beyond, but we noticed that that does encroach into the zone one, so we are comfortable removing those if if that's the benefit we're comfortable with keeping those if that's preferred no any any voluntary uh, stormwater best management practices we certainly will welcome so thank you for going the extra step there to incorporate the rain garden with the house being right on the zone one buffer line uh, the, the site plan showed two signs it, it might be better to just have a single sign out closer to the road, kind of right on the edge of the zone one and two. Is that just a little more visible? It could be something a little more educational. Otherwise, it's kind of hidden in the back. They normally delineate the no-mow zones, but you're trying not to mow that area anyway. But. Yes, sir, that's fine. So it does look like a lot of the, or not a lot, but I think that this is what you were just saying is that some of your mitigation is in an area that you that you're going to dedicate as your greenway easement, right? So are they just going to eventually tear that out to put the greenway in? The alternate? No, at the, I think at this one. I think this this is the one like at this current site is where they're giving the greenway easement and a lot of the mitigation is proposed in that easement. I think that's a question for greenways. That that was a discussion that, that Logan and I had via email and I think where we landed was, you know, it's it's a large area. Mm -hmm. It's I don't know that it's a currently being planned the greenway. There's um, a lot of land on the other side of Pages Branch. Um, it, I don't know, it just seemed more logical to plant and right. hope, hope the greenway can find its way either on the other side or through versus just not planting a whole strip and then finding out, well, that we don't want to put it there. We want to put it over here. Now, you, you sure. know, but we're, we're open to, quite frankly, whatever makes the most amount of sense. Is there any, maybe a comment from Ms. Harrison from Greenway to help us clarify this? And appreciate you being here, Ms. Harrison. Thank you for this. It's helpful. Sure. Happy to be here. Cindy Harrison, uh, Metro Parks Greenways Division. The long-term plan for the Greenway would be in that northeast corner. Uh, that piece of the easement would would accommodate long-range ability to continue that Greenway. So the planting uh, on the southwest end is appropriate. Okay, great. Thank you for that clarification. Is, is there a timeline on that? Uh I Just, don't have a timeline yet. Yeah. No, we still uh, don't have all the right of way up and down, mm -hmm. um, but this is a piece of that. So. This is a benefit to that effort, I would yes. presume. Yes. Great. Okay, wonderful. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so Legal mentioned a conservation easement for the other property that's being utilized for to help offset the mitigation needs. Um, so what are your thoughts on that? How do we ensure that as development occurs on that 
those two adjacent lots at the alternate location that, you know, the buffer zone and, you know, the conservation is going to be protected. This will probably, you know, timing-wise, be, be the pro the first lot permitted, I would think. So it would, to me, it make the most amount of sense to put a condition that the con conservation easement be recorded as a condition of this lot's permit, and then when those lots come in, it can be referenced. The buffer can be referenced and further referenced in their long-term maintenance plan. They can notate the parcel also in City Works. <coughs> and, and probably hold the conservation easement for the UNO in case it, for some reason, this never got built. Okay. Okay, it's a good discussion. Do we have, are we getting closer to forming a motion? It's motion to approve. Okay. Wait, we, yep. Okay. Um, Move a single sign by the road. Instead. Okay. Motion to approve the um, submitted variance with moving the no mo sign closer to the road and eliminating the requirements of two of them and going to one. Well, the conservation easement is part of their yeah. submission, though. And it should happen with the other property as well as part of the work that they do with staff. Okay, sorry. I, I can try to clarify my comment about that if that would be helpful. Um, so I was, I was just talking um, with um, uh, Michael about that and um, I was trying to understand exactly what the relationship with the second parcel is going to be. Um, uh, I was suggesting, I understand that there will be a conservation easement for the greenway on you know, this parcel on 135, but um, my suggestion was actually as to the alternate, the, not the alternate parcel, but the additional parcel on Elizabeth, was it, where um, uh, there was going to be um, additional mitigation. Um, my thought was maybe that a um, conservation easement on that property might better protect um, that mitigation um, uh, more permanently um, as like that property is later developed, um, Michael is comfortable with a, a long-term maintenance plan being uh, uh, recorded against that parcel. But I think you're saying that the condition, either way, that you have something with the reg register of deeds recorded against the property, against the Elizabeth property, um, that someone doing a title search on that property would find. With, with the intent being a future person of interest for that parcel, being aware that that encumbrance was on that parcel 5, 10, 15 years down the line. Okay. Based off of the intent and what the committee is discussion is, I agree that a conservation easement for the Elizabeth property would, would be an appropriate um, sort of mitigation to make sure that uh, this off-site mitigation is secured long-term and the public is aware uh, in case any other developers come down the road and look to develop that, part that particular parcel. With, with that to be recorded on both properties prior to the first permit being issued, correct? That's the condition on it. All right. It's on both properties. All right. Let me make sure I understand. So th there, there's also two ways to arrive at the same path. Uh, one is through the conservation easement. The other is through the means of working with Metro Water Services and obtaining the grading permit and having a maintenance plan for that mitigation that's done. And that's uh, not necessarily a help. Help me explain that, Logan, so we we're all, so the committee's clear. Yeah, I mean we, we're going to have a long-term maintenance plan anyway. This could just be an extra step if that's what you so think is is it appropriate. Necessary? Please. Yeah, but is the, when you say there's going to be a long-term maintenance plan anyway, yes, there's going to be a long-term maintenance plan against this parcel that this very well, he's going to develop the Elizabeth yeah, Road as well. So, so will it be recorded against the Elizabeth Road property? We'll have one recorded against this property and one recorded against Elizabeth Road as well. Okay. So, so this is new construction. So the long-term yeah. maintenance plan is also a um, it's a um, uh, restrictive deed. 
that would be recorded against the Elizabeth property also. So it's equivalent to the conservation easement, I think. But it's but, uh, up to the com committee what they think is preferable. So if there's no development, though, on that parcel ever, they don't. there's not necessarily a long-term maintenance plan that would be required. So the conservation easement, if they did it, it would like ensure that that was recorded now that's correct versus yeah. waiting for them to develop so i think that the conservation easement makes more sense yeah. and the maintenance is don't remove it so i mean it yeah they wouldn't i yeah. would think that the the conservation easement would be the best document i agree and you could add it to the maintenance plan if it ever develops or when it develops but and it can be simultaneously recorded and that eliminates that yeah. would the applicant be amenable to that without any changes to what's currently been shown? I, I believe what you guys have described is our intent. Okay, great, wonderful. Okay. Okay, sure. What do we rewind? <laughs> <laughs> Withdraw and start over? Okay. Um, the motion is to approve the plan submitted, tying the Elizabeth property to the subject property in a conservation easement to be recorded. And the mowing sign to be one, one of them located on the edge, closest edge of the property to the street. Reduction of two signs to one. And I think that, uh, there's all. a r reduction of the two signs to one. Okay, right? yeah, well, yeah. it's one sign to be. It's in lieu of two. Mm -hmm. That's all the changes. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? I second. Great. Any further discussion? All right, seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none, none abstain. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Good, good deliberation committee. Um, next case and the final case is uh, case number 2023 005 uh, 1207 Battlefield Drive. Would the applicant please come to the desk? And before this case is heard, um, prior to my nomination and then appointment to this committee, I didn't know it was gonna be on the docket today. I have a personal relationship with the applicant, a friendship, um, just to avoid any sort of uh, appearance of impropriety or favoritism, I'm gonna recuse myself from this particular matter. Great, thank you, Ms. Simpson, for bringing that up. Okay, all right, at this time, uh, we will begin this process for this case, and I will let Logan, read the applicant's rights. Did you already hear the opening statement? I think you were here, correct? Okay. Oh, you did, okay, well. Okay. Uh, case number three on the agenda, case 2023-00005-1207 Battlefield at 1207 Battlefield Drive. APN is 117084E. 9000C0, Inspectors Kimberly Hayes, Council District 25, Russ Pulley. Applicants request disturbance of a stream buffer to build a fence, continuous mowing and maintenance of portions of the stream buffer, relocation of buffer signage. Appellant is Blue Sky Horizon, represented by John Drunowski. Comments, stormwater staff. Applicant is proposing to plant 13 trees for mitigation. Staff requests that if the plan is approved, the landscape plan is revised so that no one tree species constitutes more than 20% of the total. Codes, no comment provided. Planning, no comment provided, and Greenway said no comment provided. Wonderful. Okay, I believe this is the first time this case has been presented to us, so it's nice to see a fresh case today. Um, I will open up the applicant's presentation, and, and you will have 10 minutes to present. So... I can figure out how to work this. There we go. Uh, the property was uh, acquired in uh, June of 2022. Sorry, if, if, if you wouldn't mind, it, 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 introduce oh, yeah, yourself. Sorry. and Yeah, my name is John Dronowski. Yeah. I'm a civil engineer with Tried Environmental Consultants here in Nashville. Great. And who, who, who do you have next to you? Uh, Alicia Allenberger. I'm the general manager for Paris Group. Great. Thank you. Sorry about that. No problem. So... As I was saying, the property was acquired in June of 2022. Uh, Paris Group uh, intended for redevelopment of the property uh, as kind of shown on the site plan. 
uh, first step in that process was to obtain a demolition permit for the metro. At that time, uh, the previous single family residence was demolished, and there was also construction of a riprap channel to the rear of the property, uh, page south. Uh, hmm. During that time, notice a violation uh, for the uh, unpermitted disturbance to waters of the state. Uh, that's where uh, I, I got involved in the project. Uh, I The notice of violation asked for Paro's group to put together a corrective action plan for the restoration of the site back to its uh, pre-disturbance condition. Uh, the area that you're seeing in the picture now is the riprap channel that uh, uh, was uh, part of the wetland disturbance. It's important to note, and you can see on the survey, that this area is a sewer easement uh, at the rear of the property. Uh, it was not known to Paro's group at the time that there was any uh, features, jurisdictional features, potential jurisdictional features there. Uh, in working with TDEC, we developed a corrective action plan uh, to uh, allow uh, the redevelopment of the property and maintain the rear as a yard as it previously had been. Uh, while uh, the disturbance to the wetland area was less than that would, which would be required, uh, would, 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 which would require a general permit through TDEC. TDEC obviously does not permit after the fact. So as part of our plan, we, uh, reserved a tenth of an acre of wetland credits in the lower Cumberland watershed, so in the same watershed, and uh, and that was accepted by TDEC in, in May. So they're good with us redeveloping the property, and then we've off-site mitigation through the Tennessee Mitigation Fund. Um, and then you know, we're here today. Uh, Paris Group would like to obviously construct on the property and put back a, a rear yard um, as shown on the site plan, with a portion of the zone one buffer being mowed, and then outside of the fenced area uh, would be the landscape, uh, the restoration of, um, you know, buffer vegetation. Just off the property to the east, uh, you know, which was also not known to them at the time, was that there's a small spring and, and stream channel. So that's where the, the brunt of the buffer restriction is coming from. So as part of this, you know, we'd like to put back the fence, maintain a backyard for the homes to be constructed, and at the same time apply appropriate, you know, riparian you know, vegetation to protect that spring and that section of stream uh, that for the most part was previously mowed around. Um, and, and I know it doesn't necessarily count towards Metro, but you know, in addition, we are, like I said, we have purchased a 10th of an acre of wetland credits through the Tennessee Mitigation Fund, which, you know, our thought being is if we went in and put a bunch of buffer plantings in this area, it looks nice now, but you're asking the homeowner to maintain that in perpetuity. And who's to say the homeowner's not gonna say, well, you know, this looks better as a, a Bermuda lawn, you know, 10 years down the line. So that 10th of an acre, that's protected forever. I think it's important to note that what we're trying to do is this process started about eight months ago. It was uncovered after demolition that the area that we cleared out was a bunch of brush. No one knew at the time that that was a wetland area. No one knew at the time that there was a spring there and um, we, were, we worked with Metro to try and build back that riprap area. And then it was discovered that there was more to it. And at that time, that's when we brought John in to try and finalize what's the best action that we can do to satisfy both the state and Metro, um, which is where we landed with the mitigation and working with Logan to try and figure out the best angle on how to maintain the property, but also do the development. We work with John a lot in our due diligence program. so. Um, 
we typically call on him before we actually pur purchase the property or go under contract because due diligence is really important to us and making sure we don't run into these um, issues. This was just one that was unknown to, I think, the majority of both the state, Metro, and us as well. So what we're here today is to really focus on putting back a fence that was previously there. Um, if we would have known that this was all going to take place, we would have never removed the fence to begin with. We would have made it work within our development. Unfortunately, that's not the case. and so. That's why we're here today. We've already adjusted our site plan. We have um, currently have one permitted with the city on the A unit. Um, and when we found out about the buffer stream, we went back and redesigned our property in order to, to be in compliance with the buffer stream. So that's why you're seeing the house, the shape that you're seeing it in. Um, and then on top of that, that's where we came in to bring in the the fence proposal that we're here for today. That's all. Great, thank you. At uh, this time, I'd like to open up for any public comment. Is there anyone here in the audience to, yes, I see one. Please come on up to the microphone and uh, press the button that's at the base of the mic so we can have that recorded and heard. And if you don't mind, introduce yourself and provide your address. Oh, you did. Okay. Hey, I'm uh, Sam Parrish. Um, I live at 1215 Battlefield Drive, so I'm four houses down from uh, the proposed uh, project here. Um, and basically, I'm just here as kind of a neighbor and a concerned citizen, but I also am an environmental consultant, a qualified hydrologic professional, and I do this sort of as a living, and I've been in front of y'all before. Normally, we present a variance request prior to destroying a resource and try and get the approval not after the fact. Um, so, because I've been working in this area uh, to deal with flooding issues for about the past six years, working in conjunction with Metro, have done a hydrologic determination, which I submitted in 2021. And I've got a map, and this is public record, but it shows clearly a stream that goes up towards this house. So this idea that no resource was ever known in this area, I believe is maybe questionable. Also, I don't know when the existing conditions map was made, but it shows a wetland, a stream, and a spring on the property. So if you go to the end, it confused me a little when they say they didn't know it was there. It seems like it was on their existing conditions map. So that's a little confusing to me. Um, so. I guess uh, my HD showed that it's a wet weather conveyance along some portion of it, but the upstream portion along Battlefield Drive is a stream and there's some sinking hydrology here, but always at that intersection of Battlefield and Granny White, there's been a stream. I've seen fish in it. Actually, this spring that they now have rip wrapped into uh, is sort of the primary source of hydrology for this stream, which is an unnamed tributary to the West Fork of Browns Creek and seems like a pretty important resource in Metro Davidson County. Um, so, you know, my biggest concern is I just reported this to the developer and to Metro and TDEC on November 3rd, and I was the one that made the report because when I did my HD, I clearly saw there was a stream and a spring in this location and called the developer or their representative and told them, hey, just before I report you, just what are you doing? Did you get an approval to do this? And they said that they had talked with someone at Metro or somebody and they told them it was a wet weather conveyance. And so I checked the TDEC data viewer. There's no record of an HD. I'm not sure who told them that or why, but that seems to be a, another question I would have. Um, so I guess, you know, looking at the variance requests and, you know, I think my biggest problem is they went and cleared and even my neighbor, Pam, or the direct neighbor, they tore down a portion of her fence, disturbed some of her trees, and basically just took out the entire buffer, which I think this, you know, uh, group knows the importance of buffers in terms of water quality. Um, and then the idea of rip wrapping this wetland area is to help the drainage is the exact opposite of wetland does. It's filtering, settling, and so then they tied it into the spring, which could has likely damaged it as well. So I would say it's not a minor disturbance. And I think one big question I've got is this idea of replacing the existing fence. 
the existing fence was outside of the buffer area previously. And frankly, I think it hasn't been there for many years based on my conversations with Pam and the former owner, Fred. So the idea they're replacing the fence that was there is not true. They're putting a new fence in the buffer when the other fence was actually outside of the buffer. Um, so I guess, let's see what else I've got here. Um, and I think that, you know, the idea that the fence will protect the buffer and they'll do some plantings along it and that's enough seems it's sort of what any normal developer would do is put a fence with some plantings along it. And I think that, you know, also they're proposing to put a structure in the buffer, which I don't know why that's not part of this variance request, but I don't fully understand what gets approved by who. Um, and then the corrective action plan, you know, it does mitigate for the wetland. You know, they would have had to get an aquatic resources alteration permit for impacts to that wetland, and they wouldn't have actually had to purchase mitigation credits, but, um, you know, it doesn't mitigate for impacts to the buffer in Metro Davidson County, as I'm sure you guys are aware of. Um, so, you know, and I think this idea that purchasing the wetland credits is better than fixing the wetland. I mean, it's been there since 1940 and has been in good condition and with some signage and easements or other things, I think it could stay protected if they were to preserve it. Um, and I think that's kind of all I've got. I just wanted to put forth some of my frustrations at sort of the process and I've talked with them and they've sort of claimed that they're working with Metro to do the riprap channel, but then they told you know, me that they were working with a neighbor and that's why they put it in. And so to me, it's a little unclear who told them what and what, uh, how closely they've worked with Metro at this time because it doesn't seem to me that they have maybe worked with y'all as closely as they claim to have. So those are my big concerns. Um, and I've got, you know, a picture of my HD map which shows the stream and I've got some other pictures from the initial clearing which shows kind of after I reported them, they still continued clearing, excavating the problem soils which were the wetland soils obviously that they wanted to get rid of to put this riprap drainage and even dumped some fill material that in my mind was a little questionable, had some plastics and construction debris in it and it's just kind of sad to see what's happened to this property and after all I've kind of worked to, deal with the flood issues and we're almost there. We're getting a new stormwater ditch and I'm excited to not have flooding around my house anymore, but obviously this infill development and impermeable area is leading to more flooding issues and disturbance of buffers is also a big part of that. So I think that's important for the committee to consider. So. Can you expand on the flooding? I know that I've, I'm familiar with a lot of flooding on this street over the last 10 years, and I've, that's the first I've heard about a potential solution. But Yeah, that's... so um, basically where the section is a wet weather conveyance, the big problem was these undersized driveway culverts. And so we've subsequently met, worked with Metro, and we've got a plan to put in sort of a concrete culvert, replace all the undersized driveway culverts. And, you know, according to Matt Taze, that project's supposed to happen sort of the end of July. I guess that's this month. So hopefully very soon because, you know, I've been flooded, you know, about five or six times over the last five or six years. And so it's, you know, been a problem and I'm hoping, you know, this is a big drainage area that goes to that ditch. So I don't know that it's going to solve everybody's problem all the time, but it's going to make a big difference in just kind of the wellness of my family and sort of safety of the folks on Battlefield Drive. I've seen pictures of dads carrying children out on their backs through yeah. knee deep water trying to get them down the street to evacuate yeah. Yeah. and it's it's a bad it, it's problem. a little scary you know i can't leave my house in some instances because it's not safe to drive across my driveway and traps us in our house and makes it hard for emergency responders to get to us and so it's a big issue and thankfully after six years working with metro we've got a solution so appreciate you asking about that jay uh, and also appreciate you being here today. We always welcome uh, adjacent neighbors to, to show up and, and voice in support and opposition. Now, but I'd love for you to, to share your attachments with the committee as well that you brought with you, if you don't mind, sure, if that's okay, yeah, so we no, can pass those around. And I can leave these with you. or Would, would you mind come, come through and hand it to Mr. Lewis here, and we'll take a look at those as we continue. And are there any other questions for... Um, I'm sorry, I, I forgot your, your last name. Parrish. Mr. Parrish. Mr. Parrish. Before he steps down. We'll take a moment to take a look at these. Okay, see, seeing none, we'll, we'll, we'll call you back if okay. we have some additional questions from Thank these you. attachments. Thank you Thank again. Thank you all for your time. Appreciate it. Of course. Okay. All right, I, I, I'll go ahead, Ms. Camp. Um, while we're looking at these, does Metro have any comments? 
given the information that Mr. Parrish shared? Um, Mr. Parrish contacted me early in, in the process with, with his concerns, and we, we let most of the enforcement go through TDEC. Um, the wetland that, that was uh, filled in and altered, I guess is the best way to describe what they did, is smaller than what we would um, require a variance for, so it is less than 0.1 acres and of low or moderate quality. So on that one, we decided not to pursue enforcement because they can get approval for um, altering that wetland. Um, anyway, what we did decide to concentrate on is the buffer for the stream. The stream does start, um, I believe, on the adjacent parcel. John, correct me if I'm wrong. But, but, but the buffer then goes across onto their parcel. So what we were requesting was the protect, protection of that stream buffer. Um, and, and that is what they are here to discuss today. And just a question for the applicant. The, the fence piece that uh, is part of the request, is that shown in, I guess you can't see the photo, but there's a, there's a replaced section of fence that's already been put back. Is that? That is on the neighboring property. During demolition, our demo guy accidentally landed a tree on that fence line, and we have told the neighbor that we will gladly replace the whole thing and actually it's not on the property line, it's about a foot and a half approximately off, and we agreed with her that we would bring that her to the property line, and she did agree to that, along with making the whole situation right as it was an accident. But during all this, this was uncovered, and we haven't been able to do that until this gets resolved. I, I did have a question, Is it, it's, and it's hard to see, and I apologize, I can't pull up my GIS because we don't have access to their network, so these are just PowerPoint slides. Um, was this the previous location of, of the fence on the, can, can you see that? You could look at my computer if that would help you at all. And b before you do that, I, I need to close the public hearing unless there's okay. any other uh, folks in the audience that would like to come up and speak in opposition or support of. Yes, okay. Okay, great, we're closing the public hearing. And is, is here where the new fence is gonna be? Okay, yeah. So we, um, we did get clarification that the old fence was located um, Along, along this area, but the new fence, is it on the property line or is it just north of the property line? Just north of the sewer. Just north of the sewer easement, so I guess right about here. Oh, you can't see it? Said on the left side there. If you can zoom in to that. Can you see anything I'm moving? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so I can see your cursor now. If you can zoom into the existing conditions. And the existing conditions map was uh, updated once the uh, riprap channel, once this problem had come to light, the riprap channel was added, uh, the location of the spring was added. So it's not as if this was known and documented and surveyed in beforehand. It was added to the original survey at a later point in time for the purposes of demonstration here to show what we were going to existing conditions and then how the, the new configuration would be. But yeah, you can see the fence right there. The it uh, goes across what would be the, the, the buffer right there in that corner. Uh, the new fence does encroach a, a little far, further into the buffer, uh, and that's where the variance is uh, to maintain that area as a mowed uh, yard, and then the buffer plantings on the outside. And we've talked to Rebecca about uh, buffer signs on the inside of the fence so that the homeowners know that outside the fence uh, is a, a riparian buffer. Good. And I think Alicia, um, you know, when they were first doing the demolition, uh, they were in coordination with uh, Metro. Logan, I'm not sure if you recall all of this, but the riprap channel came about due to um, Mr. Parrish's phone call when this all was discovered originally. And we worked directly with Kimberly and 
Robert, and I can't remember Robert's last name, but he actually met us out there on site and came up with this plan to put in this riprap channel. Um, that was not something that we did on our own accordance. So can you speak to that a little bit more about like why or what, like what the, yeah, like I was, just need more information on that. I was not involved at that point, I guess. I got involved later, so I don't know if Rebecca was involved then, but and Kimberly's not here to speak on that. But I guess if it wasn't clear, what Rebecca was trying to say was the wetland buffer has been eliminated because they mitigated it through the offsite disturbance. We're only concerned about the stream buffer. So the fence was outside where the wetland buffer is, but the wetland buffer is not there anymore because it's been disturbed yeah, and mitigated. That, that was going to be my comment. I mean, they got a state permit for the wet one to go away, whether that's yeah, you know, we like it or not, that that's done. This is more, we just heard two cases where we proposed a lot of mitigation for disturbance in a zone two buffer, and they're asking to have no zone one buffer. Right. And so that, I mean, that's kind of the black and white of it. Yeah. Okay, so I think that's where I was confused. On the, on the plan, that 25 foot no disturbed wetland buffer does not exist anymore. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. That's okay. correct, yeah. Got it. Okay. Going back to the TDAC and, and the stream determination, do, how, wh wh where did that score? Uh, we didn't do a determination. Uh, when we went out to the site, it had already been disturbed. So we were going out there to, you know, formulate the plan uh, for the corrective action plan that TDEC wanted. That's when I noticed uh, the uh, spring, um, you know, connection to groundwater, you know, as a as a primary indicator of a stream. Mm -hmm. So it was pretty clear where the stream had started uh, at, at that point. Um, at, I'm also a qualified hydrologic professional. Uh, you know, I, I think the, there was a previous comment that the riprap channel was the primary source of flow. I, I don't, personally, I don't think that's accurate. I think it does obviously contribute. Uh, when I was out there, uh, there was no flow within the riprap channel. Uh, the spring was bubbling. There was a lot of flow coming from that, that spring. So uh, I, I imagine that that's the primary source of flow, you know, as it approaches uh, battlefield. It's also important to note that the spring is not on our property. It is actually off of our property. I was going to ask, where exactly is the spring? It's right, it's right here. It's a 30-foot okay. buffer. Yeah. When, you, when it terminates, yeah, so you yeah. do a circle around. It's actually state property, I believe. So, I mean, if you look at the data viewer, and if you look at Metro Maps, uh, I think they show a portion of that being a, a stream, not all the way up to where the spring location is. And, uh, and then I don't think there's ever been a previous, uh, well, there hasn't been a previous hyd hydrologic determination submitted to TDEC. So focusing back to the fence, um, what, so why does it need to be constructed there? Like what is the hardship? Um, kind of, I, like just like what's the justification for why that fence needs to be constructed where it's proposed in the zone one buffer? I think the, the hardship for us is that if we would have known all of this was there, we would have never taken down the original fence and we would have been able to formulate some sort of yard in our development. Um, and with that not with that being an unknown and purchasing the property and going through this process, it makes the development a lot harder and it also we're we're telling a homeowner to maintain this area or not maintain it and I don't see that as a, something that's going to be maintained properly by a homeowner. And the fence allows us to kind of exclude them from that area and keep them off of that area and maintain it the way it needs to be maintained. So Logan, if they'd come in knowing the spring was there and applied for two house permits, they would, would they have had to get a variance to mow and maintain that area? Yeah, they still would have had to get that variance to mow and maintain. Yeah, I, don't, I don't think you get grandfathered in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
when it because you demolished and rebuilt. Yeah. If it were a, I think that there's other parts of the code that allow you to renovate or put certain money into the house, but. Yeah, that's a good. That's a good I, point. I just don't see the hardship and don't know why we are going to eliminate buffer that's immediately upstream of. You know, there's there's fish that are swimming right there mm -hmm. in the stream. There's a lot of water that flows through that thing, the, the roadside one. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree. I think the hardship is where I'm struggling too. It's just under like the, there's nothing that makes this different or unique um, to to require this kind of disturbance or the removal of the buffer. Agreed. I just, you know, for cases moving forward, I, these are items that, and for the developer's sake as well, need to be closely identified in the existing condition survey moving forward so we don't find ourselves in this situation retroactively. So that's a big piece here for whoever, I don't know if the surveyor missed it or, or what, what was... What, what happened in the original survey, if this is not the original and this has been modified since the TDEC remediation work, what did, where is the existing survey? What did it show? And that would have been submitted to Metro Water Services as part of your permit, and this issue would have been accounted for, I would assume, uh, well in advance of breaking ground and finding ourselves here today. Did I misspeak on any of that, Logan? No, I, I don't think so. No, yeah, that was clear. I feel like there's an opportunity here to not have the fence as far back as you have it, maybe reevaluate some of the building footprints. These, while it's not financially um, desired to reduce the building footprints, I think that's something that could be considered. I mean, we just heard a case on a very small building to accommodate the buffers so putting the fence that far back to allow for lawn to make it more desirable i mean i appreciate that there's a rain garden being thrown in here but the reality is you know the hardship is not for you all to you know financially make a profit at the expense of the waters and that's our challenge and what we have to think about um, here is protecting those buffer zones as much as possible. So I guess the question would be, in, in lieu of a, of a hard fence, uh, the you know the applicant could request a variance for plantings in the zone one buffer to create a green screen in lieu of a hard fence. I don't, I don't. Do you need a variance to reestablish the buffer? I mean, reestablishing the buffer would be a requirement regardless, right? Yeah, I think it's the mowing and maintenance portion that they want. Yeah, I just I think that if the applicant is, you know, unfortunately this could have been resolved, this could have been avoided on the front end, and I don't think that, um, to your point, that there's a real hardship here retroactively. I think uh, Mr. Fulmer proved that point with uh, if we had gone through the process on the front end for construction of this fence, and I know it sounds minor, but it is in the zone one buffer where we do not allow these types of pieces to be installed. And you're essentially asking us to eliminate the zone one buffer completely as a, as a mode area. So I just, um, I'm having a hard time, especially with the, the mitigation being offsite. We, we typically look at compensatory mitigation measures as being a last ditch resort effort, uh, since it doesn't impact necessarily in this case, the very close watershed that this exists and we know have some issues that there's active projects with Metro Water Services to, to uh, begin to correct with the culverts at the driveways. Um, yeah, the, the off-site mitigation was to address uh, TDEX concerns. Uh, you know, I, I see the, the point of uh, what you're saying, the encroachment in the Zone 1 buffer. I think Paris's group's, uh, you know, desire was that, you know, this area was formally mowed, maintained as a grass, and so they were just trying to put it back as such. But, you know, maybe we could come up with a, an alternate plan where we uh, – 
you know, maintain more of a buffer and, and change the footprint of the buildings and try to see if we can, you know, preserve that zone one buffer more in its entirety. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, like I said, the, the offsite mitigation, that's just above and beyond anything we're doing for Metro, you know, so. Yeah. There's also some great state property adjacent, you know, there's plenty of watershed right next door to this property that this is goes to my point in a previous meeting where we had discussed um, mitigation efforts done within the watershed. I understand there's a compensatory program, but I would love to see efforts done uh, adjacent to the property, especially if it's owned by the state and there's an area there that it, could be done. Well, that's what we'd asked, we'd asked yeah. Rebecca about that, and it was just there was not really a good mechanism by which to do that, right? Because, you know, if we go back and plant the riparian vegetation on this parcel, then immediately off-site, you, they're mowing right up to the stream. So it seemed like there's a really good opportunity to improve the length of the stream as it approaches battlefield. You know, if, if we could, you know, if there was a mechanism by which to incorporate that into this project, I think that that'd be a, a good workaround. Sure, and I think that it takes many cases like this to, to make change, and this is certainly the second within uh, two months that we've received that is a great candidate for uh, mitigation on whether it's state-owned property or adjacent metro properties to help the overall watershed with in the neighborhood so that's you know hopefully we can use as a case moving forward to get something done in that in that way um, I see this maybe moving into a deferral potentially such that we can you can you can have an opportunity to come back and, and reform uh, keeping the zone one buffer and providing maybe an alternate method for screening or fencing that's outside of the zone one does anybody else have any comments to build on that y'all want to defer or do you want I think. Yes, we'd like to defer. Great. Okay. Make All right. Motion to defer. Yep. We have a motion to defer. We second. Second. Great. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Seeing none. Great. Motion carries to defer. Thank you. We'll see you in a, in Thank a month you or two. Much. Of course. Okay. Great. I think that's the last case that we had. How are we on time? 9.48. Is that faster than Chair Dodd gets through three cases? Or, huh? Don't call smack it. Oh, and it's his birthday. That's right. <laughs> Happy birthday, Chair Dodd. I know you're watching this uh, tape today, and uh, we all love you. All right. So I do have one more item to discuss here. I think, uh, do we have anything else out of business, Logan? Um, the next meeting will be at Midtown Hills Police Precinct. Uh, we don't have the access to Sunny West. S September, I don't have a room yet, but I'm trying to keep it on. <laughs> Lindsley, maybe at Lindsley Hall. I'm looking in that room, so we'll find somewhere, obviously. <laughs> we have three or four cases next month, including this one, so busy time. I wanted to see if it was possible to have our Compensatory mitigation discussion in September, possibly. Yes, please. Okay. Thank Instead you. Of, uh, August, maybe. And I think cases like this today are great. I just I would love to get through the bureaucracy of getting things done within neighborhoods where these mitigation efforts matter. I, I, I mean, this is a great example, and I hope people and others that maybe go back and watch this tape can use this as a case study for why we need to maybe change for the better and how we handle these these efforts. Um, you know, so I'm going to add that to my last motion <laughs> that I made for metro properties and parks to get proactive in this as well. Yeah, we'll have, make sure to have Cumberland River Compact and parks and. Whatever. And if anyone from the state, you know, for, for a case like this where we're adjacent to state property, I mean, I just I would love to find a way to make uh, stormwater management practices better within the neighborhoods that the impact is is occurring. So okay. In that regard. The, the residential infill is hammering the capacity of all of our storm drainage. You're off. Um, it's all the commercial projects are self-sufficient. They always take care of themselves. But if you look at just Clifton Lane and Battlefield, oh yeah, the rooftops that have been added over the last ten years. Yeah, it is crazy yeah. how how. That, they're the ones that are really contributing to a lot of our flooding problems. That's right. And didn't Metro file a lot of the homes around Oaksville and all mm -hmm. the And so the, the Appendix H stuff is, is a great first step, but I mean, it it's I think that there needs to be a, a big focus there. Yeah. 
Well, hopefully, I'm, I'm thrilled that this committee is in agreement in this. We've had some great examples, and I love having uh, the neighbors come to express their concerns and firsthand knowledge of what's happening in their neighborhoods after living there for years. And so that's all part of how change happens, is the more cases we hear that have these issues, I think we can maybe work together as a commission, as a committee, maybe a commission after tonight, uh, to, to make some change in stormwater. Yeah, I do have one more. Sorry, I just remembered something because of what Jay said. Um, there's going to be a planning representative at the August meeting to talk about a, some sort of planning study where, that's addressing flooding concerns, kind of, and w what development's been done in the city in the last few years and how much impervious area that's added, things like that, is my understanding. So, Yeah, if you, if you look, a good example that, that I point to is uh, at Hillsborough Warfield, there's that twice daily. If you look at the yeah. neighborhood behind it, if you yeah. go back four years, it's all ranches, and then you go yeah. to today, and it's every lot. Every house, yeah. Yeah. It has two roofs and a big driveway. Yeah. I mean, it is wild oh, yeah. how much it's changed. And we need housing, but we also don't need to flood people. Yeah. <laughs> I think you're just saying that we need smart growth. <laughs> smart growth. Cumberland River's the lowest it's ever been. Right. Yeah. 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 Well, we did have one more item, and that kind of goes along with what Logan was saying with the relation to meetings and meeting times and places. We've been jockeyed around a few times, like our next meeting is going to be in uh, the police precinct, potentially, if we get a room. So in addition to that, we've also lost some members to professional organizations, maybe, you know, uh, Ms. Stokes, Carrie Stokes, last year, last year to Leadership Nashville that always has their uh, dates on a Thursday, and it's all day. Um, and I, I want to maybe propose amending the meeting date to Wednesday where it seems like there is uh, maybe some better room availability from an, again the same time uh, 8 15 to, to noon um, but I think that um, it says eight but our, our meetings are Logan I think this you meant 8 15 but um, access at eight. room access room access at eight uh, to adjust this time to, to Wednesday so I think that may be beneficial for retaining members and, and having a consistent venue. Um, so any, any, any objections to Wednesday mornings? Is that a problem for anyone? Uh, much better. Much better? Okay. How do you feel? I don't, I mean, I'm fine either okay. way. It, it, good. We just need to make sure that there's nothing in, in an ordinance that says something about notification dates and list a day or, yeah. you know, that right. causes a conflict. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All that. Yeah, and I think yeah, there is like signs must research. be up on a Thursday instead of a Wednesday. Yeah, I, don't, I don't think there's anything that specifies it. So it's up to the chairman. We did have a conversation at your point with Tara um, uh, last month about possibly amending this. So, Brittany, does that work for you? I know you're okay. Yeah, that'll work. I know. I'm sure you just cleared your calendar for yeah, Thursday, Thursday coming on board, <laughs> but I uh, hate to make you do that again for Wednesday. So that that'll work with my schedule. Okay. Do, do we need to vote on that or? Um, that's my understanding, I think. Or do you need some more time to confirm this tentative schedule and rooms? No, these dates would, uh, I mean, I've already confirmed the boardroom, theoretically. For those dates, I can confirm the Sunny West for the other ones. And okay. That'd be good. Yeah. With our chair. He was good with it, right? I haven't talked to him specifically yes. about these yeah. dates. Yeah, but he, he, was, he was good with it. I spoke with him as well. I didn't, I don't think I sent him the specific dates, but he knew the concept at least. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll entertain a motion to make a motion to allow Logan flexibility to move if the dates work. <laughs> Great. Well said. <laughs> a well said motion seconded. Any uh, discussion? Seeing none. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none. Motion carries unanimously. Great. Thank you all. And then, uh, yeah, motion to adjourn. Since we have a, can we have a gavel oh, in our new room? Let me, oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you had one. Sorry. I'll, I'll undo. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again or for more information on this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.